Hi, this is Brian Gallagher. I'm the CEO of United Way Worldwide, and thank you for joining our session in this extraordinary meeting. Um, I'm not sure um, exactly where everybody is in the world, but this is clearly a 24-hour virtual meeting. So for those of you who are at odd hours where you are, thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, we've got a We've got an impressive group of thought leaders to um, to dig into the our topic, which is fighting poverty through and beyond COVID. Um, I'll do a couple of minutes of opening. I'm going to forego the formal introduction of our panelists. Uh, you have their you have their names and their titles and background. So please, if you haven't um, taken a look at that, please do. But suffice it to say that this is an impressive group of leaders that. Uh, we look forward to having a conversation with. Um, I'm going to ask each person for a couple of minutes of their reflections of the time in which we live. I'll put a question to each one of our panelists, and if we have some time at the end, we'll try to have some some back and back and forth conversation. Um, you know, one of the one of the metaphors that I think, at least for me, resonates most with me in terms of the time in which we live is the fact that we're all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. And I count myself as a person that's incredibly fortunate to have a pretty good boat in this storm, but not everybody does. And it's clear that the pandemic has, among many other things, laid bare the inequity in the world, the inequality in the world. Um, as an example, the average American family has $400 of unrestricted cash, personal cash. So anything that happens to disrupt their life is going to put them in a very desperate situation. Uh, we have the largest um, inequality globally since the 1920s, which obviously was a period before a global depression. Um, and the systems have been laid bare, whether they're healthcare systems or economic systems, social systems. Um, and so the, the, the key, I think, to this conversation is, is you know, if you, if you look at places like the World Economic Forum and, and lots of organizations, they're talking about the, the great reset coming after the pandemic. And I, I, um, I, for one, am actually more taken by the idea of reimagining how our systems might be more people centered, might be more community centered versus being designed by institutions and institutional leaders to, for the benefit of those institutions. And so, again, we've got a great panel that's going to dig into uh, uh, that, some of those frameworks and their own observations in the time in, in which we live. Uh, Tanya Woods from the Kind Village in Canada, why don't we start with you and share your uh, kind of global observations and the insights you've drawn from the time in which Thank we you very find much. ourselves It's a right delight now. to be here with the community. I certainly, like many of you, was looking forward to our meeting in March, and we all know what happened then. So here we are. Um, I'm the founder and chief impact officer of Kind Village, the world's first peer-driven community dedicated to expanding local philanthropy and creating impact through contributions of skills, services, goods, and other non-cash resources in kind to local charities and nonprofit organizations. Today, we're doing that largely in support of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Um, what we've seen with COVID certainly isn't something that we didn't expect, um, you know, pandemic, as well as a number of other complex risk factors that were going to impact our communities at some point or another have been on our radar, thankfully, due to data and forums like the World Economic Forum for some time. The question was really just when. When I started uh, my career, I went to law school and, and enjoyed that very much, but stumbled into um, a personal health challenge and wanting to do philanthropy at a very young age and not having time and not having money to engage. And it was then uh, back in 2013, in fact, that I realized we had a problem in our system. We were rapidly advancing globalization as a, as a discussion point and a functionality through technologies. And we were leaving our most vulnerable behind, our most vulnerable people, our most vulnerable organizations, and in fact, some of the most important of both because we weren't designing technology with them in mind. They weren't designing their technology with us and they weren't part of the conversation. 
So here we are. I was sitting there almost 10 years ago thinking, how can I be a philanthropist if I'm not rich? And I thought, well, the most valuable asset I have is my knowledge and my education and my relentless passion to pursue change. Today, I've got a larger tribe than I could have ever had imagined. Today, around the world, and certainly we started to see it in March and April and May and June and right now, human beings brought their empathy and they brought their goodness and they brought their kindness and their dedication to one another to the forefront through technology. We saw people playing on balconies, their instruments. We saw companies delivering masks, doctors gathering on Slack channels to talk about how to help each other out in local communities. And it has continued at an exponential pace. It is nothing short of remarkable. Thank you. So this is what we have seen. I don't know if I've surpassed my two minute mark, but I will say this just to conclude the thought and leave space for others. Please. At the World Economic Forum in January, we launched our commitment as an organization to kick off the first ever in-kind challenge globally, where we were going to commit to pledging and tracking 1 billion in-kind actions in support of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. And I am very pleased to tell you that Although the pandemic has brought great hardship, it has shone in a very important spotlight on our community organizations and the resources that we do have in our hands right now. And we've been able to secure over 20,000 pledges of services, goods, and in-kind resources for over 500 charities and not-for-profits in 20 communities across four continents. And we've tracked almost 100 million in-kind contributions in the last six months alone. So uh, with that said, I would say now is a very important time to advance our conversation on philanthropy, on poverty and on how we leverage grassroots uh, efforts to do so. Thank you, Tanya. Fantastic. Uh, Kim Samuel, your, your observations and insights. Yes, thank you very much for inviting me. Many of us are aware that poverty doesn't just refer to a deprivation of income. It encompasses other deprivations such as poor health care, nutrition, a lack of clean water, or education. What is less obvious is how social isolation and poverty reinforce one another. When we don't have adequate relationships and systems of care, we are more likely to stay in poverty and feel stigma, shame, and humiliation. COVID-19 exacerbates these entrenched inequalities and points to our lack of resilient systems. My colleagues at the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative report that an additional 490 million people are at risk of falling into multidimensional poverty as a result of this pandemic. So today I want to focus on two groups in particular which are experiencing heightened inequalities during this time. First are children who make up half of the multidimensionally poor. Severe child malnutrition increased by 14% with the pandemic so far, and UNICEF has calculated that 872 million students are unable to head back to the classroom this year. Countless others have been forced to help provide income for their families, forgoing the opportunity for an education altogether. The second group I want to focus on is older people. Last week, the Washington Post newspaper conducted an analysis that revealed that beyond the staggering U.S. deaths caused by COVID, now over 200,000, there have been 13,000 more deaths caused by dementia compared with previous years. So we have to ask why. The answer is this, because many of the people with dementia are dying not just from the virus, but from the very strategy of isolation that is supposed to protect them in the first place. Older people are literally dying from loneliness and isolation, while the world largely stands by and shrugs. As we think about the work of fighting poverty through and beyond COVID, I fervently believe we need to ask ourselves, what do we value as a society? We need to focus on developing new systems in education, healthcare, service delivery, and governing, all that go toward building belonging. Thanks. Fantastic um, framing of that, um, Kim. Thank you so much. Um, Shweta Shalini, um, your observation and, uh, and insights. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Rasis. I think uh, it's a fantastic platform that we've uh, come together. I think when we talk of uh, global poverty, the global 
uh, multidimensional poverty index, the MPI, shows that many countries actually made significant progress in the last decade in improving the lives of the poor. Uh, but in fact, uh, India, the country that I come from, was one of the topmost of the three fastest growing uh, nations to kill and eradicate uh, and fight uh, and better the MPI index. Uh, as a society, I think we can't allow these gains to be reversed by nothing and absolutely not the pandemic. And hence, under the able leadership or of our honorable uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi ji, we have doubled our efforts to tackle the poverty at the rural as well as urban level at different levels and with different schemes. And I think we are strongly focused to eradicate under the SDG 1, eradicate poverty by 2030. But one of the most important things was for us is was to tackle the diversity and the complexities of India. And I think one of the first things that we did was to diversify MPI into the various states and the federal uh, levels that we have in India. And hence, we practically took the targets of the MPI to every state so that one of the first three things which are most critical to fight poverty, collection of data, analysis of the data, and making sense of the gaps was something that we could probably do. And I think we are bang on there. Yes, we are one of those people who are badly hurt because in India, 400 uh, million people work in an unorganized sector. And hence, we will definitely uh, be badly hurt with this pandemic. But we have very strong plans to ensure that we can parallelly process overcoming the pandemic and the poverty levels as well. Shweta, that's um, really, really helpful um, set of observations, especially this idea of the gains that were being made before the pandemic and uh, how does momentum be recaptured post-health crisis. We'll come back to that. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Danny from Oxfam, if you would share your observations and insights. Yeah, thanks, Brian. Look, I think Kim and Shweta and others have talked about the fact that if this is going to be a great reset, we do have to think about um, the great reversal that we're seeing in, in terms of many of the hard-fought wins on, on poverty, half a billion more people being forced into poverty, um, hundreds of millions being forced into extreme hunger. Very early on in the pandemic, a, a colleague of mine at Oxfam got a text message from a taxi driver in Nairobi who he normally uses when he's in Nairobi. And, and this man wrote to my colleague and said, this virus is going to starve us before it infects us. And sadly, that is what we're seeing. Colleagues at Oxfam have shown that more people are likely to die as, uh, this year from the economic disruption caused by the pandemic than the infection itself. Um, and I think, but that said, I, I am optimistic. I suppose my, my, the insight I wanted to share is that this is, you know, a, a disruption as great as this deserves a bold response. And I think this is exactly the moment in human history where we have to think about what mm -hmm. does universal social protection mean? You know, if we are a civilized humanity, what is that basic provision in, in income, in healthcare, in, a, in safety nets that we are willing to um, provide each of us um, as humans? And it's also the opportunity for uh, to rethink the fundamental drivers of, of inequality and injustice. And let me just conclude with, you know, we're talking this stark fact that we're talking about half a billion people around the world being pushed into poverty at the same time that the world's largest companies have already made tens of billions extra profit so far this year. Um, windfall profits from uh, from the disruption caused by this pandemic. Um, and, and Jeff Bezos, who, you know, I have no, nothing against Jeff or, or, uh, or Amazon. If, if Jeff paid a $100,000 bonus to every one of his 800,000 staff today, he'd still be richer than he was at the start of this pandemic. And I hope he does, because that would, that would go a long way in, in securing fair work conditions for his staff. But it's a, it's a manifestation of the deep inequity that this, uh, this pandemic has revealed, but also the opportunity, I think, to reset 
uh, how our sh uh, shareholder short-term capitalist system works in the global economy. Thanks. It's great, great insight as well. I mean, the, you know, the discussion of how, how do we distribute wealth and opportunity today versus when we are in national industrial uh, economies. It's, um, it's great. It's a great push. Linda, why don't you, uh, why don't you share your, uh, your observations and insights and maybe a word about your organization. You're going to have to come off mute, Linda. <clears throat> Thank there you. you Thank you, Brian. Uh, just a few words. Um, I'm Linda. I'm a mother of five. I know uh, what poverty is, and it was by the empowerment of people who and organizations that uh, allowed me to become the successful businesswoman that I am today. I'm a serial entrepreneur. And one of the things that's very important to me as a single, uh, at the time, as a mother of five children and the challenges I had raising these five children, it became very, um, very clear to me that not all organizations understood the challenges a mother has to work and to provide for her kids, even in the health. COVID, as we know, has exposed the growing presence between the rich and the poor, especially when it comes to health, to mother and children. And I think sometimes we forget that mothers are the future because they provide the children. And without us, we would not be able to have a society and we are the ones that are educating and loving our children. And sometimes we are not able to do that, but we need organizations to help us. Many initiatives to aid, to aid the poor have not always delivered on their promise, and I've experienced that myself 30 years ago, for the simple reason that not all people understand what the issues are from the ground level perspective. And a good example, real quickly, is there's an advertising campaign in Mexico City urging people to wash their hands and using Santa, Santa to sanctify uh, their sanitizers. But you got to remember, not all of the areas in the rural regions have water and not all the areas can even afford the basic fundamentals of washing hands. Right. I believe we need to start corralling uh, educated women and women who have experienced poverty, women who have been successful, which is why during the COVID crisis, together with Julia Middleton, I became involved with a global initiative called Women Emerging from Isolation. And what we're doing is we're working on a campaign to do education, to help from personal experiences, but also to donate our resources, uh, our support, anything that we can to educate these mothers and to help these young people. It's vital for the corporates, and I speak from a corporate perspective because I'm the one that will go and engage and fight to raise money. I do a due diligence as an investment company, so I will do due do, do, do diligence on uh, nonprofit organizations. And it is vital for us corporates to engage with nonprofits in a more practical manner than the past. We simply put, experts can offer their knowledge for free, as what Tanya was talking about. We can offer uh, in kind. We can do a lot of things to be an effective force to help produce practical solutions. Women emerging of isolation can act as an intelligent bridge between corporates and nonprofits, especially in the health sector, sector especially in empowering women, young women, and most importantly, to help women uh, who are mothers to educate and to have the opportunity to feel safe and get some of the basic things whether it's just food, water, and education for our children. And I am committed to that as a corporate. I'm committed to that as a businesswoman. And I would like to see more initiatives, not only from the nonprofit, but the corporates. And I would like to challenge all of us to find a, a common ground. It's wonderful to be a part of larger organizations, but let's start from the bottom up, whether it's rural, let's start in baby steps, and also, I see, in, I'm also living in Vienna and Austria, and there's a, people are moving out to the countryside because they're afraid. So there's a lot of things that we need to take into account in order to support each other. And yes, the pandemic is here. I will see it as an economic tsunami coming, and I think we need to prepare and support uh, each other. But most importantly, we need to think about the future. And I want to wake everybody up. It's not so much only our businesses. It's about the children. 
It's about the mothers and it's about educating. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. And thanks for introducing women as a stakeholder in a multi-stakeholder uh, process. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful framing. Lord Bird, um, your observations and insights um, in uh, you have a foot in so many different worlds. Um, what's uh, what are your insights in, in terms of the time in which we live? Well, um, you can't cover everything, obviously, um, and there are too many things to cover. Um, what I've found so interesting uh, and depressing at the same time is the fact that um, when I started the big issue as a homeless magazine in imitation of an American magazine uh, nearly 30 years ago, there was a situation where we were working with maybe seven, 9,000 homeless people a year throughout the United Kingdom. Um, and that went all the way through to COVID. And then there were people removed from the streets. And then we had to wake up to a harsh reality that all the people I, were work I was working with were people like me who'd come from poverty, who'd come from crime or come from the streets, come, and, and that we were very, very damaged people. We were people who were socially prepared, almost socially engineered to fail because they went to shit schools and they lived in shit housing and all sorts of stuff like that. And we were socially prepared. And then COVID hits, and suddenly you have this new world where a people today who have never, ever come anywhere near homelessness, who have come anywhere near joblessness, are losing hundreds of thousands of people in the UK will be losing their jobs. I am really, really frightened of this sudden mass homelessness hitting the metropolitan countries and actually destroying many of the abilities that have that the educated middle class, the comfortable classes, who have been giving their money and supporting projects all over the world, and suddenly the project that they will be supporting is themselves. And they will therefore be in a situation that they can't help grow the fight against poverty that we universally are all committed to. So that is my big issue. I have started something called the Ride Out Recession Alliance. How can we get people to surf over the recession? How do we get the government to keep people in their homes? Because if they slip into homelessness, then it, then the cost can double and treble and the damage done to our children and our children's children. So the Ride Out Recession Alliance is an attempt that's starting in the UK. We've got people of various parts of the world interested in it. And what we want to do is build back better. We want to uh, put a hole through the fact that most people who live in poverty live in poverty because of a low-wage economy, that all the big jobs that have been produced in Britain, the vast majority of jobs that have been produced in Britain since we entered the, U the UN, oh, sorry, the EU, 45 years ago, most of those jobs, are, you're still a member of the working poor. Yeah. You're still yeah. Stuck. And those are the big, big issues of today. We're going to come back. We're going to come back to that in terms of um, in terms of what is multi-stakeholder capital capitalism look like the jobs? How do you how do you create more equity? And to you, Lord Burden, to Shweta, I'm going to come back to you about concrete government policies you think need to be employed. Um, Tanya, let me go to you first. You know, technology, you talked about technology, and it seems to me that, you know, new technology is like any new innovation. I don't mean this as, pejorative, as pejoratively as it's going to sound, but but bad guys figure out how to use new things before good guys and, and women learn how to use it. So we've learned how to use technology to divide us, to get into our tribes, to to fight with each other, to demonize each other. Um, what's your view of how technology or social capital is going to be built in a digital age when it's been so analog and institutional in our history? You're going to have to take yourself off mute, Tanya. You're all doing I was great. Say, this is a loaded You're not talking. That's good, but then unmute yourself. <laughs> I hope you can hear me now. Yeah, you're, um, you're good. 
listen, that's a loaded question. I mean, let's just be real about this. I, you know, I, in a pre-call, uh, I said, you know, Lord Bird's been a really big inspiration of mine. And I worked three jobs to put myself through my law degree at London School of Economics. We didn't have any scholarships. I come from a single mom home and I know exactly what it's like to have to work and sing for your supper. But I was smart enough to get in and I certainly wasn't going to waste that opportunity. And I knew it was a gift. And the best education I got, honestly, at LSE, I mean, aside from the academic rigor, was the person standing at the corner of the King's Way every morning selling the big issue. And it wasn't a joke. I mean, this is quite serious. It drove my mind very, very early on to appreciating that people aren't always in their situations by choice. They're born into it. They land in it. Things happen for a variety of reasons. Along the way, the sole thing we as human beings need to be doing is considering our fellow human beings because every single one of them is our neighbor. And we could be in their spot and they in ours. It's just a matter of circumstances and, and what, you know, luck and place we are at whatever time it's happening. So once we all get a little bit humble about that and we take ourselves away from the good context or the bad context that we exist in, we can start to really look at our systems. And I've been working in technology now for over 20 years. And one of the key things that I said about seven years ago to our prime minister at the time and our leading politicians was, hey, we're not teaching coding and computational thinking in schools. What does that actually mean? It doesn't mean we need to develop a whole bunch of coders, but when we're talking about technology and globalization, every single person on this planet needs to be engaged in that conversation. Yeah. They need to be able to think critically about what is being built, what is being used from what is being built, how their value is being extracted in exchange to make other people wealthy and to drive traditional systems like capitalism forward that continue to marginalize. And it's been my, my life's work, and it will be until I die, that we have to be insisting, absolutely uncompromisingly insisting that when we are talking about charity, philanthropy, technology, any factor of any ecosystem today that drives our economy or impacts it, we must be asking tough questions and be humble enough to learn. In the context of an election, I mean, we watch debates and, and all of the like. I'm Look, I'm in Canada. I'm privileged in many ways. In other ways, I live in an island. But the reality of the fact is that most people in the world do not understand how to engage critically with technology. They don't know how to protect their digital rights. They don't know how to design new systems. They're not designing systems like, for example, AWS that's deployed across the world and made one person and his shareholders incredibly wealthy. We need wealth redistribution. So the core yep. focus right now is we have to focus on peer-to-peer -peer technology. So what are the empowering technologies? What are so the technologies? Wrap that up, wrap that up I will. Quick. What are the, you opened up a door, Brian. But what right, are the technologies gotta, gotta that give the data visibility to everybody so we can make better decisions? And where can we insist on transparency? And this is where I think technology has a very significant role to play. So I encourage everyone on this call and everyone listening to really look at blockchain, to look at AI, to consider the ethics around all of it and start to set in place policies and laws. So that let me, it. To that point, Danny, let me ask you in, in reacting to that, um, how much of getting a fair distribution of of income, wealth, and opportunity in the world is going to be market-driven and developing the skills that people need to succeed in the marketplace versus a, and I know it's not a zero-sum game, but versus a universal social protection um, approach. Can multi-stakeholder capitalism work, or is it going to take a different approach altogether in your mind? So uh, I'm going to say two things that are, that may, may seem contradictory, but hopefully they won't. Uh, one is I think market-based solutions can work. You know, those of us who work in NGOs have long been frustrated that the sort of interventions that we can make are always limited by the scale of our resources, whereas market-based interventions have the potential to really scale and, and make transformative impact in societies. And I think there, you know, I hope COVID op opens up the opportunity for more radical interventions that transform the way that markets work, that make build them to be more inclusive and, and take protection more seriously, take participation more seriously, taking leaving no one behind more seriously. But on the other hand, this can't just be done out of the goodness of some well-intentioned business leaders' hearts. This has to come with hard regulation that I think enforces better standards on businesses, that uh, brings 
new fiscal interventions that help protect that floor, if you will. You know, where, where we and many others are supporting uh, an idea to create a global fund for social protection, uh, a, a, a global fund mechanism that will redistribute resources so that every human on this planet has access to the basic wherewithal to allow them to survive and hopefully even thrive. The, the idea being that if you don't have the basic wherewithal, you can't take advantage of the marketplace. Exactly. You can't take advantage of the digital transformation and all the wonderful opportunities that I hope the world can. And that will cost mil- trillions. Yes, that's true. But just think of the trillions that are being spent on propping up businesses in old you know, industries and polluting industries in in industrial societies where you know and i think that's the shift that i hope we can make if this is a reset it's got to be a reset of the of the of the floor as well as the that's the, fantastic yeah. shwet i'm going to come to you first and then lord bird put your put your public sector leader hat on and how do you think about that how do you think about the role of government in the you know that you know, that floor, that social safety floor versus the market incentives that allow people to succeed long term. Shweta, how do you think about that in concrete policy initiatives? Yes, thank you, Brian. That question is brilliant. Uh, let me tell you uh, specifically, there are a lot of people, I think Tanya, uh, Danish, uh, I heard Linda too, talk about one dimension of poverty and one dimension of tackling poverty. I think multidimensional poverty needs a multidimensional approach. And specifically uh, with respect to India, where we have so many complexes, so many stratas, uh, so many diversities, I think what we've done, and I think under the able leadership of the current government, we have been cl- given clear directions to have a multi pronged approach. And yes, at this point of time, I think to everybody alienating poverty, I would say, or eradicating poverty looks like a distant dream. I I promise you, oh, well, you're back, Shweta. Oh, you're, you're am back. I back? Yes, you are. I was about to yes. make a bad so joke I, about I you. Would, as I would rather, I would want to remind that... I would rather want to remind that at one point of time, uh, so did uh, slavery and uh, probably apathy. So, uh, you know, we we have taken. So, for example, uh, Amartya Sen uh, recently in one of the WF uh, uh, conferences pointed out that in. We're a little unstable on that technology. I mean, we're going to give Shweta another opportunity. Lord Bird, how, how do you how do you think about government's response to this question of um, fair distribution of income, opportunity, the safety net floor versus the marketplace? How do you think about that from a concrete policy perspective? Well, I I I think the government. Um, well, in this immediate crisis, uh, I think the British government has had a go at um, socialising distribution uh, and putting their arms around as many people as possible. Uh, but I, I think one of the problems um, that I have run into is that actually the programmes that are there supposedly to help lift people out of poverty are often very, very short term. They're very, very limited. They're very, very, um, you're a victim and I'm going to give you something. Yeah. When I started the big issue, I said, I'm not going to give the homeless and the poor nothing. I'm only going to give them opportunity. And actually, we have managed to change the lives of many people throughout the world by giving people an opportunity and not look at them as another species, which I think most people do. Governments look at the poor as another species. Let's go and do something for them. And I think, so if you look at the way that social security is used, it's not very secure. Uh, If you look at the way that social security is not about social opportunity, if you look at the big programs, a lot of those programs have arrested development and arrested people in the process. So it's not a matter of not having enough money in those programs. It's it's a disincentive in too many. It is much more expensive in the metropolitan countries 
to keep people poor than it is to free them up. It costs billions and billions and billions of pounds to keep people poor. 70% yeah. of the activity of our parliament and every other parliament in the world is always dealing with the collateral damage produced by poverty. It's about time we started growing up. And the only way we're going to start doing that is jettison most of our attempts at getting people out of poverty, which is giving them a hand up and not a hand out, not a way of energizing them. They're human beings. They're geniuses. All they need is to be freed up. That's my big. That, that, that is a fantastic framework. And we're, we're coming to closer to our end. Linda, I'm going to come to you first. So please unmute and then. And then Kim, um, uh, Linda, you think corporations are ready for this kind of dialogue? Are corporate leaders ready to step into a, um, and I mean corporate leadership, you know, it, at a tipping point number, ready to really talk about a new social contract or no? I think, I think right now corporates are extremely challenged uh, with the current pandemic and the economic tsunami that was coming because they are socially responsible when we had the corporate, uh, you know, corporate responsibility. And now they're looking deep within themselves and with their organizations because they're going to be going to lay off almost what they've done in statistics, one third of their employees. So are the corporates ready to do something? Yes, they want to do it first. You know, there's an old saying that says charity begins at home, and they are helpless because they've never been in this position. So I think a dialogue from experts like yourselves to explain to corporates not to give them, and I love uh, very much what you said, Lord Bird, not to give them a hand out but a hand up because this today is going to be corporate responsibility of corporates who have had people who have been there for many, many years and have to give them the golden handshake or young mothers who, are, you know, they're in debt. This is going to be a pandemic uh, economic uh, response to a pandemic that will take as many years to recover. And yet I do think corporates are ready to get help. They need support. They also want to be seen as engaged, engaging, and especially those corporates who are making money right now. There's a lot of them, whether it's medical institutions, but they also know that for image purposes, a dialogue must be started. And I think today is the time to come up with proactive approaches, not the hand out, the hand up, in kind using technology, um, in kind and coming with the experts who know very well how to restructure. So, yes, the danger that I see, and I have to be honest, is are those people who are in denial and think that the world will get better and that the, the, and the nonprofits don't make some radical changes on how to approach the corporates because the corporates are desperate. They need help, but they don't know how to get help. Sure. So, so there's, there's opportunity, but there's also, you're going to have to, everyone's going to have to think differently if you're going to engage corporates differently. That's correct. Thank you. Um, you know, Kim, what, one of the, one of the things I've, I've thought about a lot, not just since the pandemic, but for a few years before is that we define success in all the wrong ways. Um, you know, fundamentally in a macroeconomic way, when, if we think about it in terms of what people want in their lives, they want to be safe in their homes. You know, they want some sort of economic security, not to be rich. They just want to be able to sustain themselves. But then they want a sense of purpose and they want a sense of connectedness, you know, be connected to something larger. You talked about social, social isolation. What do you think the cost is to communities, to countries, to the world, if we don't deal with the fact that, more and more children and, and seniors are being isolated um, during this pandemic and maybe even afterwards if we don't pay attention to it. What do you think the cost is of that? Cost. Thank you for the question. Even identifying what we mean by cost would be important to start. So is it is it the economic cost, for example, of fighting a global pandemic and we've been talking about the balance is it the, the I think Danny said that the the loss of life is 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 from the pandemic 
is uh, is less than the risk of loss of life in terms of food and in, food insecurity in terms of hunger. That would be one example. So I I might come back to the question, maybe just to in the, the small amount of time to perhaps reframe the question along a different uh, thought. And that would to offer that as my answer, which is that these these separations that we're talking about, for example, what is the economic cost as opposed to we put in another category, the human cost or the cost of somebody's um, challenges for, for mental health, what is the cost of helping that person? I think the costs of not having an integrated philosophy are always going to be much higher. The separations, we can go back thousands of years and find uh, slavery. We can. We can go back thousands of years and we can find inequality, this tendency to put someone as the other, someone less than so that I can jump up. Yeah. And I think that if we look, for example, what, well, the example that I gave about older people in nursing homes and the statistic of so many dying from loneliness and isolation, not only from the disease, it points right back to where I started, which is what do we value? And if we don't, if we don't balance these out and look to the communities themselves to tell us to define their poverty to us, to define what are the things that they need the most? What are the things in terms of social connectedness and belonging that bring that about? Because we know that's not only a human need, I'd maintain it's a human right. That yeah. we, need, we need to go back to, and it sounds simple, what do we value? I think if we don't do that, then all of us, and I include myself, are coming up with solutions with respect. None of these are new. That's, None of these great. are new. And so the it, thinking has to change. It's brilliant. And it, in, in keeping with this discussion, um, pushing back on my framing of the question to essentially say it needs to be framed differently is exactly right. You know, we've got just a minute or so left, and I don't know if we're going to get kicked off of this platform or not because I'm not who's knows who's in charge. But let me go around as I see you and give us give us one final 10 second thought. Tanya, what's after this discussion? 10 seconds. What would you want people to, to take away? Everybody's responsible. Everybody has the capacity to be a philanthropist. Everybody needs to be part of the dialogue. Get engaged. Perfect. Danny? Uh, big disruption, big response. Excellent. Linda? Move forward. Keep your eyes open. And don't forget the mothers and mothers and children. Amen to you. Uh, Kim? Look before you leave. We see all of the solutions in front of us. Some of them we could jump to very quickly and they could set us way back. Let's look at potential collateral damage, not only what we define as success. Lord Bird. Let's do an enormous audit of what works and what doesn't work and fill in the gaps. We need dispassion. We need to step back and find out why things are not working. And we need an intellectual uh, engagement and not simply an emotional engagement. Outstanding. Outstanding. Uh, each, of, each of you, um, as we concluded, I, I, I wouldn't have said this before we went in, but my final 10 seconds is there's no way any one of us succeed unless we all succeed. And if the world's never given us that lesson, it sure has, it sure has right now. Thank you to um, who you are as leaders and as humans and, and for taking part in, in this discussion. And thank you all for joining us in this uh, important conversation today. Have a great day or evening. Um, Can we all keep in touch? Can we all keep in touch? <laughs> Let's yeah. all keep in touch. We will, you know, Lord, Lord, Lord Bird's contact information will be easy to find since he's a public official. You just reach out. <laughs> I have a feeling he will, he will stay in touch. But let us as a group commit to being a part of the solution. Thank you all very much. Yeah, have a nice evening. Well. Bye-bye. Thank, well. Thank you. Feel free to log off.